Okay, so hi everybody. Um, welcome today's, to today's Alligator Academy workshop. The Alligator Academy, which is the Applied Lifelong Learning and Information Gator Academy, is a series of workshops on important, on important life skills that you may not have learned in school. We have many interesting workshops coming up. Topics include um, communication, mental health, personal finance, healthy cooking, and important legal documents. And that is just this semester. So we look forward to having more next semester as well. Workshops are held every other Friday during the uh, fall semester at 12 noon. This presentation is being recorded. Um, today's topic is disaster preparedness. So our speaker today is John Garris. John Garris is the Regional Manager for Disaster Preparedness at the American Red Cross in Northern Ohio. He has been with the organization for over 45 years. His duties include educating the public in fire and disaster preparedness, providing and installing free smoke alarms to families, manager of sound the alarm program, educating youth with fire and preparedness education uh, through the youth education program manager, and preparing our volunteer workforce to deploy to large events throughout the USA disaster training manager. He has personally assisted in large events for Hurricane Katrina, 9-11 in New York, and recently in Portland, Oregon for the wild. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, I guess we'll start. Uh, thank you very much. I am gonna turn my camera off uh, to make it easier, but uh, thank you for attending today. And um, as was mentioned, uh, we are gonna talk about disaster preparedness for everyone. And uh, fact is, uh, oops, let me, let me do this again. Okay. Uh, the fact is that disasters happen all the time. Uh, they happen often. Sometimes they have little or no warning. Uh, and they can happen anytime and anywhere, as we see, uh, as we see what's happening in the Gulf Coast with Louisiana, with the hurricanes out west. Uh, we still have wildfires. Uh, we had flooding and so forth in the New York, New England area. And even here in Ohio, we get uh, fires, single family fires all the time. Every year, every year, communities across the United States face disasters of all different kinds. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, winter storms. We're getting ready for that here in Ohio. You know, we saw the wildfires last year and this year, and it may not get the press and the media as much as it is, but uh, this year is actually affecting more people than last year. And last year was probably one of the worst on record. But our number one disaster that the Red Cross uh, responds to, and actually the most uh, common disaster everybody is most uh, susceptible to are single family fires. Every year, the Red Cross responds to about 70,000 disasters every year. About 90% of those or about 63,000 are single family fires. So it's important to know what kind of disasters face us in order to prepare. And these are this typical type of disasters or emergencies that happen in Ohio in our area. As I just mentioned, home fires are our most common response. Tornadoes, flooding we get, especially along the uh, Ohio River and so forth, Southern Ohio. We get extreme heat, we get those uh, little uh, burst of it, not to the extreme that California and out west is getting, but we do get that here in Ohio. We don't have that many wildfires, but we do get brush fires occasionally uh, when it gets so hot and uh, the grass uh, becomes so brittle that it can ignite in uh, without a lot of efforts, especially when people are, uh, you know, uh, started through campfires and things like that, and they don't take cautions on it. Thunderstorms happen all the time around the lake, so forth, and like I said, we get ready for winter storms in, in Ohio. And our region past experience tells us that, that these are the common disasters that help us uh, or hurt us in our area uh, that have huge impacts on individuals uh, throughout the United States and specifically here in Ohio. So if any of these disasters that we talked about, a lot of people assume that somebody else is there to help them. Obviously, the Red Cross is an agency that can work with them, uh, but that that uh, but we have to take precautions for ourselves. However, rest the resources aren't there always to support everybody immediately. If you think of the magnitude of a disaster, something like uh, the hurricane that just went through Louisiana and Mississippi, there's thousands and thousands of people that are affected. 
uh, not only evacuations, but they have power outages. We saw last year uh, in Texas uh, when they had power outages uh, and then extreme uh, winter storms because um, their infrastructure, they normally don't get winter storms in Texas. And when they lost the power outage, they lost the heat, which then had a lot of pipes bursting in homes and they had flooding and so forth. So disasters happen all the time. And first responders, disaster organizations like the Red Cross, government agencies like FEMA and hospital emergency rooms do their best, but sometimes they're overwhelmed. On average, these groups are staffed and prepared for normal day operations. Uh, but again, resources can be limited during a disaster. And so the truth is really, we need to depend on ourselves first. And why, and that's because things like roads may be impassable, utilities may be unavailable. We see that in the Southern part of the states. Uh, hospitals and first re responders could be overwhelmed. Think of COVID. Banks, groceries, gas stations, the infrastructure of the city are affected because they may not have power. Uh, people may not be working, again, because of COVID. And then you uh, add in the natural disasters that are occurring. And a lot of things are affected. The infrastructure of the communities are. So you may need to, Think of other ways that uh, you can help yourself and help others as members of your household, neighbors, or those who might have functional needs uh, that may need an extra little hand. So it's important that we don't count on receiving help right away because there may be a lot of people asking for that same help. So the more we can do for ourselves, the better we're going to be prepared and the better you're going to be able to recover from a disaster. So all of us can and should prepare for ourselves in our households. And will preparation always be perfect? No. And will preparation make things quick and easy and painless? Not all the time. But planning and preparation uh, will help you be safe and recover a lot more quickly. And so what does really preparedness mean? It's we can be prepared when we take protective actions or protective actions to be safe, react in the correct ways, adapt, adapt, to, tough, tough, to, adapt to tough challenges, and also to recover quickly from difficulties themselves. So Red Cross is a program, it's the Be Red Cross Ready program, what we're doing today in general preparedness. And so what does it really take to be prepared? And what we say is you need to do three things, is get a kit and your kit should contain supplies that you're gonna need at home or can easily carry with you if you had to evacuate. Making a plan, you should identify the steps that you're gonna need to respond to specific disasters uh, and for each disaster, decide who in the household, household is going to do what and where you're going to go and how you're going to communicate with each other. Those are all components of having a plan and being informed. And I always say this is probably the thing that people want most to us when we respond to people in disasters, being a single family house fire or a hurricane or wildfire or whatever. People want information. They want to know when's, when can they go home? What kind of assistance is available? What is the Red Cross that going to be able to help them with? Or who is helping them with whatever? Information is key. Uh, so it's important. And it's important that you're informed and learn about, uh, it's good to learn now before disasters happen about how you're going to get that information in your community if a disaster occurs and what resources might be available for you. Is this allows you to respond a lot quicker, help you uh, to help yourself, your household, and your, and your community. So we're going to look at these in a little bit more in detail. So what does it really get a kit mean? Uh, it's in a disaster strikes in your community. You might not have access to food, water, electricity, medical facilities, or even a drugstore. And, and I'm a separate there. I always tell people when it's getting supplies and they say, well, getting a bunch of stuff together. Uh, and there's a couple responses people say, and they go, I don't know where to start. And I always go back to about a year and a half ago when COVID first hit, think of how inconvenient you may have been or uh, what hardships you're, you, were, you personally went through and how prepared were you and your family? So I would think that as a starting point and think about all the things that you would have, would have made your life a lot easier had they been in place or you had some supplies there. And that's a good starting place of things that you need on a regular basis uh, to get through your day and day in, day out and so forth. So that's a good starting point. Preparing a disaster kit for your household is an important step to keep everyone safe and healthy in a disaster. 
And we thought we talk about having uh, assembling two kits for supplies. And if you put one kit with everything, you need to stay home for at least three days, maybe longer if you're able to. Uh, and something that will work to gather enough supplies uh, in this kit to maybe last at least two weeks. The other kit is also, also called a go bag. It uh, should be lightweight, smaller version of what you can take with you if you had to leave home quickly. It should contain everything that you would need uh, to be on your own for about three days based on the needs of the members of your household. This could be one kit for the entire household or separate kits for each individual members. And by uh, specializing a kit for all the members of your household, especially if you have medical issues, that is important to do is what do each person in your family need to get by for a couple of days if you really needed to have some materials. Customize these kits to meet everyone's personal needs and the disasters that are common with the area. So it's going back to the first couple slides here. Think about what could happen in your community and, and then use that again as another starting point of what kind of things that you're gonna have to prepare for. So to build your kit, think about what you use on a daily basis and what you might do if those resources were limited or not available, COVID. Start with the basics, the food, water, clean air, and any other life-sustaining item members uh, of your household might need to maintain their health and safety or even independence. And basic supplies should include things like non-perishable, easy to prepare for foods. Some the kind of foods you, you don't want to put the, you know, baked beans or, you know, whatever it, that items that you really don't like. If you're going to put items, food items that you're going to store, think of items that you enjoy eating because in a disaster they're stressful and we're going to talk about that in a little bit having items of comfort food items that might sustain you for a few days, the things that you like to do, maybe canned fruits or something of that nature. Think about those kind of non-perishable uh, items that you can prepare very easily because you may not have uh, heat or electricity or even natural gas for your stove and so forth. Something that you can pre prepare very easily, a manual can opener <laughs> and your uh, the, the the current generation probably doesn't even know what a manual can opener is because everything's electric or it's pull top rings, but that could be a godsend in a disaster. It's old school, but it can help you in a lot, a lot of situ situations. And then bottled water. And we say you have at least one gallon per person per day uh, uh, is important to do and for a three day purpose. And some of it is for using for drinking and some of it's for hygiene, washing and so forth of that nature. But one thing with bottled water, a lot of people don't realize this, bottled water actually has an expiration date. If you've ever had water, bottled water that was picks up that plasticky taste, it's because it's probably old. And so often people in good conscience, they try to store things like canned foods and bottled water and they put it in their storage area and they don't check on it periodically. And what happens is stuff gets old, it outdates a little bit. So think about that. If you have bottled water and you're storing for over a year or so, it may not, it may not kill you, but it may not taste the greatest either. Uh, so think about that. Remember, you may not be without electricity and you may uh, only have the amount of water that you've stored too. So how much do you think you need to store? As I said, you should have at least one gallon of water per person per day, half for drinking, half for sanitation. And then you may need more, uh, depending on specific needs for those in your household or, or the environment, you know, obviously out West, uh, you're gonna need more hydration than other. If you have pets, think of them as well. They drink water as well. You also want a flashlight and a battery pod powered or, or hand crank radio. These are inexpensive and they're invaluable because even if you don't have batteries, a hand crank radio can keep you informed. That information thing, again, I mentioned earlier. And if it's possible, a weather radio, so you can keep it uh, apprised of any weather related uh, updates that, that are important for you. Uh, you also, one of the things a lot of communities have is uh, signing up in advance with your local emergency management agency in your community uh, or, or your township and so forth. Uh, it's called reverse 911. And what that is, is when there's an emergency in the community, they basically 
call back out to people that are registered and let them know of some impending issue that's happening. So that's something to think about if your community has that, it's called reverse 911, check with your local emergency management people or even the fire department, they could let you know that. Extra batteries, obviously, first aid kit, uh, seven days supply of medications, prescription medication, and any of those medical items that you may need, especially if you have a condition that you need to change bandages on a routine basis, make sure you have a supply of those. Keep a copy of prescriptions and the doses is in the treatment. And the reason we're saying keep a hard copy of it because if there's no power, you may not have internet, uh, you may not be able to get to the drugstore or go online to check those things. A lot of hospitals and, and the pharmacies put those online, but if you can't access that, you may not have comments with it. One of the things uh, was mentioned, I was in Oregon last year for the wildfires. Uh, the fires were so bad, they melted most of the cell towers. So they had uh, limited uh, phone communication throughout the whole state. Uh, which made it even more difficult to communicate, not only for the first responders, but the people that live there. So think about having hard copy of some of these important documents, not only things like medical things, but things like your, your lease and your deeds, passports, copies of those in case you need those and have to evacuate, you have copies or if they're lost, if your home is destroyed or whatever, you know, uh, type of things. Personal hygiene items, personal documents I mentioned, uh, copies of current copies of digital photos of your family members uh, is important in case, especially if you have elderly or little children in the home, uh, it's important to have them available. So in case somebody gets displaced, uh, you can reunite with your family or it makes it easier uh, when they're looking for family members. So having updated pictures is important on that and, and update those every six months or so because people, especially kids, they grow older, they, they start looking different type of a thing. A cell phone and a cell charger. So often we grab our cell phones, but we forget about our charger. And once that battery goes, uh, you're, you're dead in the water type of a thing. Having emergency contact information for each household member and family members that were part of your dis disaster plan are important. Extra cash, actual cash. So much of our society is on credit cards and debit cards and plastic and internet. Uh, but if that those systems go down, you may not have any access to your money. You could have a million dollars, but you don't have access to it. So having some actual cash on hand in your emergency kit could be also uh, something that's very helpful in an emergency. Emergency blankets, maps of your area. Going back to uh, Oregon, I was, uh, like I said, I'm obviously from Ohio. I'd never been to Oregon and I was out in the area uh, serving clients and uh, there was no GPS because a lot of the towers were down. And um, you can't, you know, it's hard to find a paper map any longer. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I've been, you know, I'm older. I'm with the Red Cross for 40 plus years. Uh, used to having paper maps, but if you try to buy a paper map now, uh, good luck on that. You know, it's hard to find those things, but that's something that could put in your emergency kit as a backup. Maybe you don't need it necessarily, but having a map of your area might be helpful, especially if you don't have access to GPS and your phones to get that. Uh, these are things that, you know, build redundancy, build redundancy, redundancy in your emergency kits. Don't feel overwhelmed with this list. There's a million things you could put in it. Preparedness is a process and it takes a little bit of time. And a lot of people say, well, I can't afford to do all this. I don't have the money to go out and buy all these items. I would say 90% of what you need in your emergency kit, you already own. It's a process of gathering them, putting them in containers that are mobile if you had to evacuate very quickly, but having them in a congregate area where uh, all the members of your household know where they are, check on them periodically, update them uh, when need be, and they're there when you need them. Uh, it's important to do that, but most people have most of the items that they would need in an emergency kit. It's, this, it's the process of gathering these things and putting them in a common area where everybody knows. Don't forget to make a kit for your pets or service animals. Uh, pets are part of our family. I got dogs and cats, and so, you know, uh, part of my plan is having an idea of what I'm going to do with these guys if, if I need to evacuate and I need to have some items for them. Having a photo with your pet together in the same photo 
is important too, in case your pet gets displaced with you. You know, a lot of times in disasters, you know, animals are involved with this too, and they get out or they may get out of your yard. And in normal instances, they might be able to find their way home because they're, they're going for their normal sense that they see or they may know about. But in a disaster, those uh, markers may be gone. They may uh, uh, be confused just as people are and your pet may be get lost. And it may be the ticket home for that pet if, you, if uh, when the, the animal is picked up, uh, you, if you have a picture with your pet in the same picture, it's gonna make it easier for you to get that pet returned to you. After Hurricane Katrina, it was so crazy in the sense that a lot of people thought, you know, the hurricane was gonna hit, we'll leave the dog or cat home, we'll be back tomorrow after the storm passes and we'll go to the shelter. And unfortunately what happened, they couldn't go back to their homes for months. And a lot of pets were left home behind. And people on, you know, on the news in Ohio, uh, the rest of the United States, they thought the people are banding their pets. But what had happened, they couldn't go back to these areas because it was unsafe. And so many pet rescue groups came out of Hurricane Katrina that are still involved. So it's important that you have a plan for your pets. Don't leave them behind. Uh, have, have them part of your plan. What are you going to do with the pets? If it's with family or friends, taking them with you, going to your shelter or a vet, you know, having an idea what you're going to do with those guys in, in an emergency. And no matter what's in your kit, it's important that everything works. And when a disaster strikes, check the expiration dates, as I said, especially on food and medication, the batteries, at least twice a year, replace those. Replace anything that is expired or is near expiration and keep it updated. It's important to do. As I said earlier, customize your kit it's, uh, for you. And uh, it's important that you do that to customize your kit based on the specific needs of those in your household or the types of disaster that are possible in your areas. For example, there's weather radios uh, that have text displays and a flashing alert so that uh, you can stay informed even if you have difficulty hearing. Uh, other things that uh, you might need that based on specific needs could be something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, you want to store items in your kit, uh, could be things that are important, medical supplies, uh, such as syringes, uh, glucometers for those with diabetes, diabetic testing strip, you know, you know, those kind of things. If you undergo routine treatments or receive regular service, talk with your doctor or service provider about their disaster plans or how they're gonna uh, continue treating you. Assistive or adapted supplies is important, uh, including supplies for service animals. Service animals are working animals, they're not pets. Uh, they have a specific job to do for that person that's assigned to them. Uh, it's important to do that. Communication boards or tablets in case uh, to communicate even in a disaster. Baby supplies like bottles, formula, baby food, diapers, the common sense things that we sometimes forget about and we take for granted until we need them. And it's like, oh my goodness, I need this. Pet supplies we talked about, collars, leash, uh, um, um, bowls, pet carriers if necessary, extra set of car keys or house keys is important. Those are kinds of things. Think of anything that you might need uh, with the types of hazards that might happen in our area. A lot of times with tornadoes, you know, one of the items we tell people is have a whistle in case you get trapped inside uh, your home or you're looking for something to make yourself known. A whistle, a simple whistle, uh, matches, rain gear, work gloves, uh, plastic sheeting or duct tape, scissors, household bleach for cleanly, uh, cleaning things, entertainment items like a comfort, you know, to, because we get stressed out in it, having a deck of cards or just your favorite book or a game that you can take your mind off things. Even if you're in a shelter being safe, uh, what are you going to do there? You know, so take your mind off things to, uh, so you can retool yourself, you know, sleeping bags, sunscreen, insect repellent based on where you're at. There's a lot of things that you can think about. The key thing is think about your family what does your family need in an emergency is really what you do want to have in a kit. Having a kit for everywhere. Uh, since you don't know where you're going to be when a disaster occurs, consider preparing supplies for work or your vehicles. Kits for work should be in one container, such as a backpack or bag. It's a ready to go grab bag uh, in case you're, you have to evacuate. Have some food or water in the kit. Again, rotate it periodically 
Also be sure to have comfortable walking shoes at your workplace in case you have to evacuate, which requires long distances. A lot of times, um, and we saw that after 9-11, so many people, because the all the mass transit systems were shut down because they didn't know if there would be a continuing uh, terrorist attacks, people had to walk out of New York City miles and miles. And if you're in high heels or uncomfortable shoes, it's gonna make it even more difficult. So having comfortable shoes, a second pair of, uh, pair of those, uh, it might be an old uh, pair that you don't wanna throw out yet, but that might be something to put in an emergency kit. Not that you're gonna use it long-term, but it's, it's something that you don't have to go out and buy, but something that could help you in an emergency. A kit for your vehicle is important uh, in case you ever get stranded. Uh, things like food and water, first aid supplies, flares, jumper cables are uh, important. Seasonal supplies like blankets or extra clothing, especially in the winter months are important to do. One of the things, uh, the second component, and we just talked a lot about get a kit and get the, get the stuff together. But making a plan is important and knowing the hazards, again, like in your area uh, and how you will help you make a plan. And different hazards require different actions to take. For instance, a tornado, you need to move to a basement or the lower level of a, uh, the uh, building you're in, hopefully with no windows or little windows, an interior room, a hallway, a bathroom, a basement for tornadoes. But a home fire, we want people to get out quickly. We say you have about two minutes to get out of a house if your house catches fire. So it's important not only to get out or to take cover, but have two exits from every room. Obviously the door is one of them, but your window may be a second option. So having two exits from every room is really a smart thing to do. Talk with everyone in your household of how to prepare for and respond to hazards that are most likely to happen uh, where you live, where you go to school, where you work, wherever, wherever you're at. Think about what could happen where you're at and make plans accordingly. Assign responsibilities for each member of your household and plan to work together as a team. If a household member is in the military or has extended business travel on a regular basis, think about how you're gonna be able to communicate with them while they're gone and who's gonna help take their role while they're gone. Individuals that access or functional needs uh, will need to uh, prepare a little bit differently because they have extra needs, obviously. Create a personal support network that can help you plan and provide assistance if a disaster happens. Remember not to depend on one person in case that person's gone. Uh, you know, so you should have multiple people in your plan. Complete a personal assessment of functional abilities and possible needs during and after a disaster. Think about even where you place people in your home. If somebody has mobility issues, is in a wheelchair like the photo, uh, like the slide uh, depicts, you may wanna put them on a lower level floor so that if they had to escape, they can get out more quickly. It doesn't make sense to put somebody that can't walk on an upper level floor, especially it's gonna be difficult for them to get down there. So think about those kind of things. Make sure you practice your plan with your personal support network at least twice a year is important. And don't forget to think about what you're gonna do with your pets again. I keep going back to the pets. Most Red Cross shelters cannot accept pets for health reasons and safety concerns uh, uh, for the other residents. However, service animals are allowed in Red Cross shelters or public shelters, and, and uh, it's important that they're welcomed. They have a job to do. So service animals are just like another client in our shelters because they have a specific job that they're helping somebody with some functional needs to do. Having uh, your plan should include some of the key in, uh, details. I, as I mentioned earlier, identify two ways to evacuate from every room in your home your neighborhood and your town, depending how big the disaster is, and plan to do uh, what to do in a case you're separated during a disaster. So choosing two places to meet, one outside your home, if you have to uh, uh, escape suddenly, things like a fire, but also have one outside your neighborhood in case you can't return home or ask to evacuate. Things like with flooding and so forth, you may not get to your home or tornado goes through there and, the, and you've evacuated, but now you can't get back home. So think about where some meeting places where your family can congregate, even if they're separated, they, everybody knows where to go and how to get in touch with one another. Don't forget to consider transportation challenges if you don't drive or don't have somebody can do that. 
uh, mass transit, buses and things of that nature may not be operable during the disaster. So think about transportation challenges that might present themselves. An important part of your plan is how you're gonna communicate, especially if you and your members of your household are not together during the disaster when it hits. Make sure each member of your household has contact deals, details for everyone and they keep informed with them at all times. Cell phones are a great tool, texting, any of the social medias, if they're working. Again, you know, they may not work in a disaster. So think about a backup plan in case that. Determine now ahead of time what important records you're gonna need, where they should be stored. Uh, things like safety deposit boxes or fireproof boxes are, are good uh, materials to have to keep those personal important documents for you and your family. If you lost all of those in a, in a fire or a disaster, having copies of those uh, is an uh, immense help uh, trying to get those replaced if you had to lose all those. If you've ever lost a purse or uh, some of your IDs, your driver's license, it's, it's not easy to get them replaced. Uh, you can get them replaced, but it's, uh, you know, during an emergency, it's going to be even harder to get those done. There. If you're without power for an extended period of time or have to evacuate, it's important uh, to have a place to stay. Uh, think about a cl place close to your house for school, for work, for whatever you need to do uh, in case you have to do, uh, be away from there. But also you may have to continue your normal lifestyle. And that's what happens in a lot of disasters. You know, we have people that you know, are staying in Red Cross shelters across the country, but they still are going to work during the day and coming back at night until their home is to the condition they can go back into. So think about where you're gonna stay, if it's a hotel with neighbors or friends or family or a public shelter, think of what you're gonna do. If your authorities encourage you to shelter in place, think of COVID, ensure that all the household members are aware of any actions you got to take and where they should go. And once you have your plans developed, practice it, practice it, practice it. Review them with everyone in your household. Make sure everybody knows what the plan is. If anyone has a personal support network or requires assistance, be sure to review that plan with them as well. If you have home health care nurses, include them in your plan. If you have family members that are routinely part of your everyday life, include them in your plan, practice it and include your pets again. The best thing you can do, you know, one of the most important things when we do uh, safety for little kids, fire safety, we say get out of the house as quickly as possible. And they'll always say, well, what about my pets, my cat or dog? The most important thing, the best thing you can do for your pets in a disaster or an emergency, teach them how to heed your commands to follow you. Uh, to listen to you so that when you evacuate, you can tell them to follow you because they get scared too. Worst thing to do or a worst case scenario if you're, you're if you uh, have an emergency with your house uh, and you have to evacuate quickly, leave the doors open so the pets can get out. It's going to be self-preservation on it. Uh, but that's the number one question we get from little kids all the time. What about my dogs or cat? The worst thing they could do is go looking for them. Like I said, you have about two minutes to get out of a house fire if your house catches fire. And so often we hear of people not getting out because they're looking for a pet. Leave the doors open. If they can get out, they're gonna get out. Since communication is such an important part of our plan, we need to talk about it a little bit more. And when thinking about a communication plan, think about, start by taking the following steps. We, Red Cross has what we call an emergency contact card. It doesn't have to be anything more elaborate than you know, a piece of paper with some of the key information, your, you know, the names and phone numbers, the addresses of key family members or you know, part of your network type of a thing. So keep that contact card for each household member and make sure everybody has a copy of it so that everybody can communicate with everybody in case you lose your phone, the power is out and you need some uh, phone numbers and so forth because I guarantee if you lost your phone right now, you wouldn't remember half the numbers uh, that are in there. We get so uh, uh, complacent with our cell phones now that all we're doing is scrolling, looking for pictures, hitting a button and it automatically uh, dials somebody's number. But so many people uh, you know, don't know what these numbers are and couldn't repeat this if they had to. Having a hard copy again in your emergency kit be something that would be a smart thing to do. 
choose an emergency contact and have everybody memorize that phone number. Somebody that's outside your area that could sort of be that conduit where regardless of where they're at or what happens and they're separated, uh, they can all call your aunt in Butte, Montana, if it's you know outside the area, that everybody knows to call that person to check in, let them know that they're okay or where they're at. Uh, and again, outside the area of where you're at. And then conversely, have your family members, you might be that conduit for the rest of your family uh, for, for them set, for their disaster plan. Make sure you at least include one friend or relative who lives outside of town. And, and it's important to do that because if your uh, community that you live in is impacted, you may not have access to some of those folks as well, or they may be involved in the disaster as well. In regional emergencies, it may be difficult to make landline or mobile phone calls to other areas, but you're more likely to reach people outside the area. One of the things with 9-11 happened so much. First thing everybody did is pick up their phones. When the planes were hitting the towers, everybody got on the phone system and were calling family members or whoever, and really essentially shut down the uh, communication system in New York City and it was even more difficult for the first responders who had difficulty talking to each other because everybody was tying up the, the, the lines, so, so to speak. So make sure your, each of your household members know how to text, uh, keep emergency phone numbers uh, in your cell phone and post them, uh, have them in your contact cards. Uh, Red Cross has a system that's called Safe and Well. And Safe and Well provides a central location. It's an online system for people in disaster areas to register their status so that loved ones can find out where they are and, and they have unique information about their well being. Uh, it's a free uh, tool that is available 24 7, 365 a year. And in other words, it's always accessible. Uh, it's accessible uh, in English and Spanish. And how you register is go to redcross.org type in safe and well, and it will talk you through it. And what you do is you self-register your, yourself and your family and have your other family members self-register. And so if in a large disaster and communication is uh, hampered, uh, um, uh, you will be able to go online and, and find out the disposition of them. You have, to have, you have to know something about the person you're looking for. It's not just scrolling the net. This really came into a, a really godsend in Hurricane Katrina so, because so many families were displaced. Um, again, take advantage of it, redcross.org, safe and well. Being informed, like I said, the third cog of this of uh, being prepared is being informed. Uh, we talked a lot about information of getting things together, having an idea of what's gonna happen and, and having an idea of what you're gonna do. So things that new about information, know how your community warns of coming disasters. Some communities have outdoor sirens like for tornadoes. Others depend on media and smartphones. I talked about that reverse 911. Weather radios are a great tool to have uh, they, or to listen to local stations if you still have that, uh, the cable or the television going. Having a battery operated or crank radio is important on it so you'll continue to have access to that information, even if there is no power, uh, which is important to it. And, there, and know what the difference between a watch and a warning is. A watch means that the potential for a disaster is, is imminent. Uh, on a, start taking those precautions, monitor the weather stations and local broadcast, and take, be ready to take those immediate actions if worsens. A warning means that a specific type of disaster is happening, it's, it's imminent, it's already occurring. Uh, you should take immediate action to protect yourself when a warning is issued. I always say uh, with a tornado, you will never have a tornado without first having a severe thunderstorm. So if you have a severe thunderstorm, you should be taking the same precautions you would for a tornado as you would for a severe thunderstorm because the, the, um, the, the weather is the same way and it could escalate very, very quickly toward tornado. Uh, learn about your area before you travel. Know what the disaster risks and they face, so, uh, meaning that if you're going to go to California for a vacation and they are susceptible to earthquakes, know what to do in an earthquake in areas that you're not normally accustomed to. We don't have to worry about earthquakes too much in Ohio or tsunamis or even hurricanes necessarily. 
but we do have to worry about tornadoes and things of that nature. But if you're going to these areas that have those types of disasters and, uh, and you, you're going to a, uh, that area when there could be a disaster, know what to do in it, what steps to take in port, part of it. Things to help you with that, Red Cross, uh, we'll mention this again earlier or later, uh, Red Cross and emergency downloadable apps for your smartphone. And then also one of the things, part of your network could also be your neighbors. It's a dying breed. Get to know your neighbors because they can help you and you can help them, uh, almost like the buddy system. So it's important to have as many people as part of your network as possible to help in an emergency. One of the things that's often overlooked is the emotional impact of a disaster. Uh, we've talked a lot about how to prepare for you know, the disasters and so forth. And, but we also have to recognize the need to be ready for the aftermath of a disaster once it occurs. Disasters are stressful. The good news is there's things we can do with uh, coping with stress. Uh, is the first thing to know is know the signs of stress. They're usually feeling physical or mentally drained. Um, may have difficulty making decisions or focusing. You could be more easily frustrated. You may be arguing with family or friends that you normally don't do. You could be feeling sad or numb, lonely, worried. Uh, you might not sleep or eat. Those are all signs of stress in an emergency and that's normal, that happens. So the good thing about stress, there are things that we can do to help prevent that or at least uh, combat that a little bit. You know, by getting some, you know, keeping in touch with your family members, eating healthy, drinking plenty of liquids, water specifically, get rest, stay connected with those families and friends, be patient with yourself and those around you, set priorities and break down tasks into small ones, gather information about resources in your community, stay positive and help others. And if the stress continues or worsen, or if you have someone who knows, uh, who is feeling, uh, terrible or talking about hurting themselves, that's when you need to seek immediate help. And, and that's important to do. One of the things with uh, stress, uh, children watch what we do. Uh, children are also affected by the stress of disaster and they're going to em emulate what we do. If we handle it really good, they're going to cope better. If we handle it very terribly and we don't look prepared, they're not gonna be prepared and they're gonna feel worse. They depend on us to help them cope, especially when they are, if they have to evacuate, if somebody's injured, if they see somebody hurt or dying or, or have been killed through an emergency, um, you know, they may have even a, a pet, or the loss of a pet of a friend, even if the pet, you know, is lost, it, it gets out of the house and they can't find it. Those are all stressors for kids. Um, all this may be make work, uh, made worse uh, when we do it, if they experience disastrous traumatic events in the past. Stress can also be magnified by uh, if they have to move, live elsewhere, they lose contact with their friends, can't go to school. You know, if your parent loses a job, uh, their financial uh, hardships during a disaster, that might help. Helping, having the children help remember how we react and helping them make the plans uh, practicing the plans, gathering the supplies are all things that we can do to help the children cope better with the disaster. So it's important to encourage the children to talk, to listen to them, acknowledge their fears, and answer the questions as, uh, as honestly as possible. And during that event, spend extra time with your children as soon as possible to establish those daily routines, limit the immediate exposure, uh, and even we have some materials online helping children cope with disaster. Go to redcross.org. We have a lot of material on that. Okay. Uh, we've talked a lot about information today and want to make sure you don't forget about all the tools that are available uh, for you and your family, your communities. We have talked about the contact cards. Uh, we talked about the apps uh, that we're going to mention right now again. Uh, download the Red Cross emergency first aid apps to your mobile sites. There's, I believe there's 35 different uh, emergencies that we have information on. They're free, they're downloadable. If you go to the Apple App Store or Google Play, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to do those. Uh, just like practicing uh, with your plan, practice using the Safe and Well website. Once you've registered, you have the option of updating your, your uh, 
updating your Facebook or Twitter feeds into that. The apps in those safe LOL stores are available also in um, multi-language and Spanish. Uh, but you can't count on technology alone. Phones break, cell chargers go down, the coverage goes out, phone lines become overwhelmed as I all mentioned before. So think about how you're gonna communicate when those things uh, are down and how are you gonna keep in touch with your family, it's important. So one of the things that we do have a chat, you know, have a checklist, uh, what's, uh, what's most likely to happen in my area, um, have a household disaster plan, have and practice it, have a disaster kit or get some material together, have somebody trained in CPR first aid, which is important uh, things to do. Also, uh, one of the things, unfortunately, COVID's still with us and it's gonna be around for a long time. Regardless of your political stance, if you've gotten the vaccination or not, however you feel about it, it's important that we uh, protect each other, protect ourselves, protect our families. So cover distance clean. This is a mantra with the Red Cross now. Uh, we wanna, you know, we're helping people all the time uh, through various things. And so we wanna, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't take care of others. So cover, distance, the six feet and clean. The number one thing any medical person will tell you uh, with any kind of uh, flu and so forth is washing your hands is the best thing you could do is keep clean. With that, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm gonna put this screen up there, which is important. And with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that somebody may have or any comments. I know we threw a lot of information at you, um, but it's common sense things. Think about what you can do or what you need for your family. And that's really the starting point. Any questions? I'll take my, I'll put my camera back on, hopefully so, in case somebody has anything. I see the Yeah, chat. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so, what would you say, like, you know, with disasters that are happening right now, what would be the, the biggest way we could help? I know that there are blood drives happening, but, you know, sending items, is it better to send money? What's the best way that we can be supportive during the sure. crisis? Sure. Depending on what your interest is. I mean, obviously, Red Cross is uh, about 95% of our workforce are volunteers. And Red Cross uh, are involved with all of these. So we're always looking for volunteers to deploy. Right after this session, I'm going to be, I, I mentioned earlier to somebody, I'm going to be training uh, 50 AmeriCorps kids, uh, not kids, they're teenagers and young adults. They're going to be going to Louisiana to help. But uh, as far as items in any disaster, uh, I know a lot of times you see on TV, they need water, they need food, they need clothes. The one thing what we say in the Red Cross is the best way you can help a community uh, recover from a disaster is donate money. And it's not that we're trying to pay at our coffers. What we can do when we get donations from uh, the general public and Red Cross about 94% of all of our assistance that we get financial assistance goes direct to our clients. But we're able to tailor it to the needs of that community. Not everybody you know, needs clothing. You know, they may need food, they may need a place to stay, they may need medication type of things. So donations, financial donations are always the best way in any disaster, if it's through the Red Cross or some other agency that's responding, because then we can tailor the needs uh, of what the community needs. That's really the best way to do it, as well as helping us by volunteering. Thank you. So I had a question. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience working with Hurricane Katrina and your experience working with 9-11? Sure, with uh, two different disasters altogether, obviously. And I know tomorrow is the 20th anniversary. Uh, uh, for New York, I was actually uh, deployed. Uh, I was a chapter exec at the time and I was a casework supervisor assigned uh, to New York uh, for 9-11. And I got to talk to a lot of, um, I got to talk to a lot of families that uh, were affected directly because they lost family members in the disaster themselves, um, uh, and a lot of crazy, sad stories coming out of that.
For Katrina, it's a little bit different. I was a public affairs officer and it was keeping the community informed of what the needs were, uh, what we were doing to help families and how families could get help that, that uh, needed it. And I was um, assigned uh, as a public affairs person for the Northern part of Louisiana uh, in a super, uh, super center as we call them. Uh, and at the height of the shelter, I was uh, working out of, we had 16,000 people. Uh, that were displaced from mainly uh, New Orleans, the, the Ninth Ward, you've probably heard it before, but they evacuated to the north end of Louisiana where Monroe was, where I was located. So different types, uh, essentially the concept is the same. We're, we're meeting the needs of the clients that we're serving. Uh, and it could, it, it really, every disaster, even though they're similar, they're different in their needs and who's a, involved with that. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, John. Um, and like it says on the slide, if you fill out a survey um, within the next week or so, um, you will be eligible to sign up for a prize. And there's also a QR code that you can take a picture of and get you to that link. So thank you very much, John. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay, bye. -bye.